Hello and welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode 8, The Lelantine War and Solon. In 734 BCE, while the first Mycenaean War was still raging in the southern half of the Peloponnese, a Greek polis in the north was suffering from overpopulation, which was leading to civil unrest. This was a problem many Greek polis were suffering at the time. But this specific city was Corinth, in the northeast corner of the Peloponnese, which is the city that guards the narrow strip of land that connects the southern peninsula to the Greek mainland. Corinth was a Dorian city, and the city gathered scouts and sent them west to explore for new land to colonize. And while these scouts sailed up the Greek coast and then doubled back down the Italian coast, they came across the island of Sicily. Now this place was already a well-known trading hub as the Phoenicians had settled the island several centuries before. Sicily was positioned right between the southern tip of Italy and the northern coast of Africa, Tunisia specifically. It not only was an essential trading post, but was also fertile farmland. Corinth appointed a man named Archias to spearhead the colonization. Before they even left Corinth, Archias was drawing up plans for the city. His scouts had provided detailed information on the location of his new city. The location was on the southeast corner of the island of Sicily, on a very narrow peninsula that extruded from the mainland and was met with a small island. Now the main part of the city was to be erected on the little island to provide maximum protection from foreigners. The blueprints created by Archaeus specified where each building was to be built, where the temples were to be erected, and how wide the streets were supposed to be. When the colonists set sail and finally arrived in Sicily, Things happened fast. The project was well funded, as Archias was an established aristocrat from Corinth with lots of backing. And as the city rapidly grew, the natives in the area initially were very friendly with the Greek colonists. Archias named this new city Syracuse. And Syracuse was not the first Greek colony in Sicily but it was definitely the most prominent. According to Thucydides, Book 1, Chapter 15, for the war of old between the Chalcidians and the Eretrians was it, wherein the rest of Greece was most divided and in league with either party. End quote. I am, of course, referring to the two cities, Chalcis and Eretria of Euboea. And as we mentioned before, these two cities were the strongest, most powerful, and most influential cities in Archaic Greece. They were working together to fund colonies and to dominate the trade of the Aegean Sea. But their cooperation quickly turned into rivalry, which devolved into war. And it all started when the fertile plains between the two cities dried up and food became scarce. This forced the two overpopulated cities to compete for food and resources, which quickly turned into conflict. It's interesting how you can have two groups of people work harmoniously together for decades, if not hundreds of years, but as soon as you take away their food, they turn into bitter rivals, desperate to survive. The reason Thucydides was referring to Chalcis and Eretria was to explain the significance of the war between these two cities. Thucydides was saying, The only war between the Siege of Troy and the Peloponnesian War that involved so many Greeks was this Lelantine War between Chalcis and Eretria. It all started around the year 725, 
although other sources state this was around the year 710. It's kind of hard to tell. We already talked about where Eubea was located, which is the Long Island north of Attica and Boeotia, and that Chalcis and Eretria were their capital cities, as well as the most wealthy in all of the Greek world. We mentioned already they were the first to start the colonization period in Greek history. But we didn't mention that they were Ionian Greeks and had therefore not been conquered or forced out of their homes during the Dorian invasions. This war was fought between Chalcis and Eretria. It was fought on the island of Euboea, but it was called the Lelantine War. And this is because where most of the fighting took place, which was the small plain between the two close cities, the Lelantine Plain. This plain wasn't that big, maybe 20 kilometers across, but it was the most fertile plain in the region. This is where all of their food came from. Now this war could be argued to have taken place at the end of the Greek Dark Age, for we have very little documentation from this period. But what we do know is that the two cities, Chalcis and Eretria, had allies from the rest of Greece. Eretria had the Greek polis, Megara, Messenia, Miletus, Chios, and Argos on their side. Now, if you remember, we were just talking about a war between Sparta and Messenia that was taking place at this exact same time. Well, the city polis of Chalcis was allied with Corinth, Samos, Thessaly, and even the Oracle of Delphi was on the side of the polis Chalcis. And even though both cities in the war had impressive navies and were powerful maritime traders, the majority of this fighting took place on land. Now, it most likely started as a land war between the two cities. I mean, they were next-door neighbors, after all. And they were fighting over the plains between the two cities, as they sent wave after wave of soldiers into the battlefield to kill each other, and neither side capitulated. They were forced to bring in reserves from their allies on the mainland. All of the men, all of the wealth, and all of the influence these two cities had was spent trying to destroy each other in the Lelantine Plains. Now this war happened before the invention of the Greek phalanx. And I say Greek phalanx because there is evidence that Sargon of Akkad used a type of phalanx to establish his empire. What we know for sure is that Chalcis had a very strong infantry, while Eretria had a very strong cavalry. We also have documentation of some kind of wartime agreement not to use certain types of weapons in the fighting. For some reason, both powers agreed not to use missile weapons. No slingshots, javelins, or arrows were permitted in the fighting. Now, this kind of reminds me how the Allies and Axis members of World War II agreed not to use chemical weapons. The fighting became intense. And even the nobles were involved in the battles. At some point, the king of Chalcis, Amphidamus, was killed. Now this may be because the Eretrians had the advantage with their cavalry on the plains. I mean, these are according to the sources that were separated by centuries, so take this with a grain of salt. The hero of the war, a Thessalian named Cleomachus, arrived on the island with his Thessalian cavalry. Now, I don't know if you remember from the geography lesson a few episodes ago, but Thessaly is north of Boeotia, Attica. It's on the mainland, and it's very flat. They have a lot of horses there, so they naturally had a very good cavalry. At this point in the war, the Chalcidians were almost defeated. Their infantry could not stand up against the Eretrian cavalry. And now the sides were more evenly matched. An epic showdown occurred between the two city-states in the middle of the Lelantine Plains, where the hero from Thessaly led a charge against the Eretrian cavalry. And in the bloody fighting, Cleomachus was slain. But the victory went to Chalcis. At the beginning of the war, Euboea, both Chalcis and Eretria, were the two most powerful cities in all of archaic Greece. But this war burned up everything that made them great. 
their populations were massacred. All of the fighting men were dead or injured. The farming capability of both cities was gone. Their coffers emptied. There were no winners in this war. Only losers. And from now on, Euboea was nothing more than a backwater in archaic Greece. And this vacuum of power led to the rise in cities such as Corinth, Thebes, Athens, and Sparta. In the year 667 BCE, the son of King Niso set sail from the city of Megara. Who is King Niso, you might ask, and where is Megara? If you remember back to the geography lesson, you'll recall that Corinth was the city that protected the land bridge from Attica to the Peloponnese. Corinth was on the south side of the land bridge, but there was another city on the north end of the land bridge called Megara. Megara was on the border of Attica, yet it was a Dorian city-state. It lived in the shadow of Corinth for most of its early life, but it eventually broke free and became an independent state. The king of Megara was named Nysos, and he was determined to establish a colony for his overpopulated city. King Nysos placed his son Bysus in charge of this new colony. Bysus didn't want to screw this up. After all, Megara had just founded another colony only two decades earlier, the city of Chalcedon. Chalcedon was a city located in Anatolia, in the narrow straits that connect the Aegean Sea to the Black Sea and the continent of Europe from the continent of Asia. Bysus needed this colony to be better than Chalcedon, so he consulted the Oracle of Delphi before leaving on his journey to found the next great city. The Oracle told the Prince Bysus to found his new settlement opposite that of the blind. Now this could mean anything, but Bysus had to figure out what the Oracle was referring to. So he searched for the city referred to as the blind. He traveled to the colony of Chalcedon and saw that it was established on a narrow peninsula on the corner of Anatolia. It was common practice to establish Greek colonies on peninsulas as it was way easier to defend and supply in times of war. But there was something strange about Chalcedon. There was a much better peninsula located exactly opposite the water. Chalcedon was on the Asia side of the strait. But on the European side of the strait, a much better peninsula stuck out of the coast. This peninsula not only had more land and fresh water, but it looked right over the entrance to the narrow strait. Whoever set up the colony clearly overlooked the advantage opposite the water. And so this is where Prince Bysus established the colony of Megara. The strategic advantage of this site was indisputable and would eventually become the capital city of the Roman Empire. This city was located right between the east and west, which made it perfect for trading, but it also was a large piece of land protected by water on three sides. The majority of its defenses could be focused on one side, creating large walls with little stone. If an enemy ever did try to conquer the city, there would be no way to prevent ships from resupplying the inhabitants. Once the city was founded, the Prince Bysus married a Thracian princess and started his own dynasty. The city was thereafter named Byzantium. In the year 669 BCE, the city of Argos started expanding its territory, and they started to creep into Spartan-held lands of Lacedaemonia. The Spartans retaliated, and a battle took place in Hysia that changed warfare in the region for centuries to come. You see, the Spartans were more disciplined than the Argives, but they lacked the equipment and tactics adopted by the Argive soldiers. The soldiers of Argos had a shield that protected their entire body and allowed them to use their right hand to stab with their spear. This effectively protected the body of the soldier while allowing them to viciously stab and attack their opponents. The Spartans were ultimately defeated by the Argives in this battle, but the Spartans didn't leave the battlefield empty-handed. They left with crucial knowledge, knowledge that would allow them to develop the Greek hoplite. The Spartans left Argos defeated, but their generals and tacticians developed the Greek hoplite, which was a combination of formation and equipment and tactics. 
The Greeks would stand side by side with their left hand holding a full body shield while their right hand held the spear. With the soldiers packed tightly together, the several rows of hoplite soldiers standing in formation. The army became a single fighting unit with multiple rows of soldiers to keep the line from breaking, but also protecting the soldiers from arrows and cavalry charges. The shields could be aligned to create a literal iron wall in front of the hoplites. But also, a second row could create a ceiling of iron shields above their heads. And once the Spartans saw the potential in this style of fighting, they drilled in mass to become the best hoplite warriors in all of Greece. While the Spartans were getting their asses kicked by the Argives, the Mycenaeans who the Spartans only conquered half a century earlier, rose up in rebellion. This wasn't a coincidence, as the Mycenaeans were aided by Argives. Seeing this as their opportunity to get back after 50 plus years of terrible slavery and subjugation, the Mycenaeans attacked. A man named Aristomenes led the attack, and an army of Mycenaean slaves marched over the mountains and invaded Laconia. The initial battle was not decisive. Neither side won, but neither side lost. But it was determined that the leader of Messenia, Aristomenes, was a great leader and the only possible chance the people had of freeing themselves from Spartan oppression. The people of Messenia hailed Aristomenes as a hero and even offered to make him king of all Messenia. But Aristomenes was a humble man and refused the offer. Instead, he took the title of general dictator, which was like a king, but with more power. The war wasn't in the favor of the Mycenaeans, as Aristomenes was eventually pushed back and was forced to hold out on the mountain of Iria. The Spartans surrounded the mountain and held their position for almost ten years, and during this time the Mycenaeans would raid into the lands and attack the Spartans, but again, no decisive victory could be won. In one of these raids, Aristomenes was captured by the Spartans. They dragged him out and made preparations for him to be executed. But he managed to escape. Instead of running for freedom, he returned to the mountain of Ira, where his men were still defending their last position. Eventually, the Spartans organized a final assault, and they stormed the base of the mountain. The result of this push was bloody and destructive. The majority of the Mycenaean soldiers were killed. The survivors fled down the back side of the mountain and ran for the coast, desperate to find a boat or any fishermen who could take them away from the Peloponnese. Everyone else was captured and turned into slaves. The Mycenaeans became helots once again, and this time, the Spartans weren't going to go easy on them. The entire Spartan life was dedicated to training for war to prevent a situation like this from ever happening again. The Spartans did two things here that shaped Greek history. First was the abandonment of farming. It was a waste of time to train Spartans to grow crops. Instead, the helots were forced to grow the food for the Spartans, while the young men of Sparta trained all day every day for combat. They drilled and exercised. They were very cruel to their boys as they beat them and toughened them up. Any form of weakness could not be tolerated as they needed the strongest men possible to prevent a kingdom like Argos from ever beating them again. Second, the Spartans whipped the Helots into total submission. The Mycenaeans were completely stripped of their humanity. They were less than beasts of burden. They were creatures to be tormented. Spartans would often send their young boys out to Mycenae to practice killing on the Helots. They stripped the Helots of their rights, of their culture, and of their history. The young Spartans would train to kill the Helots. Every year the Spartans would raid into Messenia and slaughter the strongest of their men. And this constant terror and harassment was meant to prevent the Messenians from ever rising up again. The Sparta we know today starts to take shape around this period. 
Back in Athens, around the year 621 BCE, a man named Draco was given the task to write down the laws of the city. You see, up until this point, the laws in Athens were not written down. This made it very difficult to follow the law. And if you ever were brought before the judges of the city, the judge would almost always favor the side of the oligarchs, or rich people who controlled everything. This led to unrest and anger among the working class of the city. This wasn't just unfair, it was corrupt. And this unrest led to the appointment of Draco to write down these laws so there could be no more misunderstandings. Now, when I first heard about Draco, the lawgiver, I thought, oh great, this must be where you get the term draconian laws. Well, I was correct. Before Draco wrote the laws down, people could be accused of a simple crime and then executed without ever knowing exactly what they did wrong. Draco wrote down in stone exactly what laws were punishable by death so that everyone knew to avoid them. These laws distinguished between murder and involuntarily killing someone, kind of like modern self-defense laws. This seems good. You don't want to be charged for murder because someone else attacked you and you defended yourself. But there were other laws that were a little more draconian, mostly in the form of debt and retribution. If you lent someone money and they couldn't pay you back, you had the right to enslave them and their family and seize all of their property. But this went into perpetuity. So if you borrowed 100 coins to start a pig farm, but you failed to pay back the money, the lender could enslave you, your children, your wife, and seize your house, and then make you work for the rest of your life. So the lender could make way more money by having you default on your loans than in having you pay them back. But this was a terrible, terrible, terrible situation. In fact, it was so bad that it wasn't much longer that people were demanding the laws be changed. You could see how it would be abused. Oh, they knew. Set you up for a fall. Oh. In the year 600 BCE, the Greeks from Phokia, on Ionian Polis in Anatolia, set sail for the west. Phokia was the northernmost Ionian city before entering the region of the Aeolian Greeks, who also colonized the west coast of Anatolia during the Dorian invasions. Their goal was to find a suitable place in Western Europe to set up a trading post between the Phoenicians and the Celtic tribes of Gaul, modern-day France. At this time, the majority of the people living in Europe were Celtic. There were Celts in Spain, France, and northern Italy, as well as of the United Kingdom. The city was founded on the southern coast of Gaul and was named Massalia. This climate was perfect for growing grapes, and the Greeks started producing wine with their new orchards. This city continued to be inhabited right up until present times, and although it doesn't go by the name Massalia anymore, its current name is Marseille. So the oldest city in France was founded by Greeks, and the wine industry of the region was also started by the Greeks. Back in Athens, things were growing pretty dire. There were increasing food shortages which drove up the price of grain. And because the landowners were typically rich oligarchs, they had a stranglehold over the good farming land. And seeing that grain had skyrocketed in price, they decided it was more profitable to export it to other markets. Now this made a bad situation worse. And this wasn't an isolated issue. In fact, there were a couple of factors working against the people. For starters, the soil sucked. It was hard to grow good grain. But also, just like everywhere else in the region at this time, the population was exploding. There were more and more mouths to feed every year. And with all of the grain being exported, it wasn't helping things. This, coupled with the draconian laws passed before, put people in a dire situation. Peasants and farmers were being enslaved because of bad loans and debts that gave all the power to the oligarchs. Things couldn't keep going like this before the people revolted. It's obvious to us now that this situation was a disaster waiting to happen, and apparently the people living at the time saw the writing on the wall. If they didn't fix this situation, the entire system would collapse. They needed to right the wrongs done by Draco's writing. 
They needed a wise man to fix the law and bring peace and stability between the lower and upper classes of Athens. They needed a tyrant. This man's name was Solon. Now, Solon was already famous for he had been the leader in a war against Megara over the disputed island of Salamis. And if you're wondering where Salamis is, it's right off the coast of Athens. It would make sense that Athens would want to claim this island for more farmland, as it was so close to the city. But it was equally as close to the city of Megara. Now, the war that broke out between Athens and Megara was only won after Solon recounted an inspiring story of their ancestors at the siege of Troy, and the newly inspired troops rushed into battle and defeated their enemies, and the island of Salamis was won by the Athenians for the Athenians. Now This made Solon extremely popular among the people of Athens. He was well-spoken, highly educated, and a hero of the people. Everyone respected him. When he was approached by the nobles of the city to fix the situation, he rose to the challenge. Solon realized that the problem with the city was the debt crisis. Predatory lenders were enslaving the population. Which meant Solon's first act was to abolish the debt. Of course, Solon had to go out and blab to his friends that his plan was to wipe out the debt. And what do you think they did as soon as they heard this? They went and pulled out gigantic loans to purchase plots of land. Now this kind of loan would surely mean defaulting and indefinite slavery. But as soon as Solon wiped out all of the debt, his friends made off with tons of gold and land. Now this isn't to say Solon's plan wiped out the debt was bad. I'm just saying he probably shouldn't have told his friends first. Solon's reforms were epic. They weren't just groundbreaking, they were ground shattering. The entire system was uprooted. The oligarch's stranglehold over the poor peasants was finally lifted. The rich and powerful were forced to let their slaves go, and the debts were cancelled. It was such an extreme measure that the oligarchs went to Solon to pressure him to undo his acts and reverse the law to the status quo. Solon knew he'd be unable to withstand such pressure. They could have him captured and tortured in order to reverse these laws. So Solon decided it was time to go for a vacation. They couldn't force him to retract his new laws if he wasn't in the city. Now where do you go when you're trying to outrun the oligarchs of Athens? Sparta maybe? Corinth? Thebes? No. No. Solon went much further. He boarded a ship and set sail for the ancient kingdom of Egypt. Solon is said to have met with the pharaoh personally, and after meeting the pharaoh was introduced to several priests. They discussed wise words of ancient Egyptian theology and religion. It is here that the priests of Egypt told Solon the true history of the Greeks, The Egyptians scoffed at the fact that Solon didn't know his own history. And according to the Egyptians, the Greeks were once a much more powerful empire. And they were at war with a powerful enemy that came from beyond the pillars of Hercules. Which meant that they were in the Atlantic Ocean. Now during this war, the gods became angry with the corruption of the Atlanteans. And so they destroyed the island of Atlantis and sunk the empire into the bottom of the ocean. Take this story with a grain of salt, as Solon did not write this down. Which you think someone would consider in the magnitude of the story. We only know of this story because Plato later wrote about it when he heard it from his grandfather who heard it from Solon. Now, does this make the story of Atlantis fake news? No, no it doesn't. But it does mean we have to look at it very objectively. There is no way the city was beyond the pillars of Hercules, which would place it in the center of the Atlantic Ocean. First off, it is suggesting that this event happened 9,000 years before the events of Solon, which would place the end of Atlantis around the end of the last ice age. Egypt was not around then to know about events happening at this time. Second, there is no island beyond the pillar of Hercules. I mean, there are a few. 
This isn't to say it isn't possible, though. I did see a documentary recently that talked about humans traveling to America from Europe during the Ice Age by hitching a ride on floating icebergs. I don't know how accurate this was, but it was on the Discovery Channel. Uh, this documentary also talked about an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that only existed above water when the sea levels were much lower. Now, if you go to Google Earth, you can clearly see there is a landmass buried not too far under the ocean. And some of these peaks are still above today and are known as the Azores or the Azores Archipelago, which belong to the nation of Portugal. Now, there is also no evidence whatsoever that humans were civilized enough to sail that far into the oceans. I mean, there is the one case where Egyptologists sailed a replica Egyptian vessel across the Atlantic Ocean. But that doesn't mean they actually did this. Also, we have to look at human civilization as a whole. Were people building anything out of stone back then? No. No, they were not. I mean, there is that one site in modern-day Turkey that dates back to the end of the Ice Age, Gobekli Tepe. I mean, this megalithic stone site was buried purposely over 11,000 years ago for no reason. So, I mean, if we ignore all of this evidence, it is quite easy to assert that the myth of Atlantis is nothing more than that, a myth propagated by Plato. But uh, some people think the Egyptians might have been referring to the colony on Thera when the island volcano erupted. You see, the date isn't 9,000 years before Solon, but it is 9,000 months before Solon. So some people tend to attribute this tale to, this, to the destruction of Thera at the end of the Bronze Age, which could make a lot of sense. Now, back to our story. Solon left the kingdom of Egypt and then headed towards the island of Cyprus, which was also home to many Greek-speaking people. After visiting the island of Cyprus, he traveled to Anatolia, where he stopped in the Lydian capital of Sardis. Sardis was very close to the Ionian cities in Asia Minor, and it was almost as though his journey was wrapping up. While he was in Sardis, he met the extremely happy king, Croesus. Croesus was happy because he appeared to have everything anyone would ever want in life. And Solon told him, you know, you should count no man lucky until he's dead. Now this was meant to explain that even the luckiest and happiest and wealthiest man has no idea what tomorrow might bring him. Sure, he is happy and lucky and wealthy now, but anything could happen that could take everything away from him. Now this was a word of wisdom that the Sardis king would not fully understand until several years later when he was about to be executed. Solon eventually made it back to Athens and to his horror, the city was not the same as it was when he left it. The laws of Athens hadn't been rebuked, but the men elected to their offices refused to leave even after their terms were expired. And this quickly led to a period of anarchy in Athens. Despite the corruption at the highest level, the economy of Athens was stronger than ever, with new construction projects popping up all over the city. The corruption grew too strong to ignore, and a member of Solon's family rose up and took control of the city by force. He was determined to put an end to the corruption. And to the shock of Solon... He took absolute power and became a tyrant of the city of Athens. This young man was named Pisistratos, and he was Solon's cousin. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the History of Modern Greece. Stay safe and stay awesome.